So I'm Ronnie, obviously, and my business partner is Sahail. Uh, I guess I'll uh, give you a bit of a background as to who we are and how we got started in the whole uh, t-shirt game. Um, I started online back in 2011. Uh, it was an online baby and maternity flash sales site. Uh, it was just me, no investment apart from my own money and a bit of the family's money. So it was a baptism by fire. I learned very quickly uh, what I was good at and what I absolutely sucked at, and that was tracking numbers. Um, but I was great at marketing. So I got on the radar of some um, pretty successful businesses in Australia, uh, and they approached me to take on their social media management. So that was around the same sort of time that um, I, Sahal and I teamed up. So uh, he actually owns a video shop in Nambour, and it's the, the only remaining one. And it told me one of two things is that he was a bloody idiot for owning a, a business that was considered a dying industry or he had the commitment to stick something out. And being the optimist, optimist that I am, it was a second. And, um, well, that's thriving now. So I asked him out on a date. Uh, we went, had a hit of golf. And, um, golf. Okay. And um, <laughs> I quickly learned that um, he was an analytical wizard and <laughs> I was not going to be able to cheat a stroke here or there. Um, because he's, he was tracking all my data. Anyway, um, so basically after that, we just wanted to get started uh, adding value to our clients and um, that led us into Facebook advertising. And we saw shirts popping up and uh, we saw a few uh, case studies and testimonials and stuff like that. And the money that people were saying they were making was absolutely ludicrous. So. We both grew up with um, parents that said, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. So um, we sort of let it go by the wayside. But with this debt hanging over my head from Bambino Brands, there's $100,000 that I'd racked up. And um, by this time, I had debt collectors and solicitors and whatnot on the phone to me constantly. Like I had caller, no caller ID coming up on my phone. And I think at the worst, there's about 10 calls a day that I was getting. And it just... It plays with your head, but one thing I said to myself was, I want to pay this back. I don't want to quit. I'm not going to go bankrupt, and I want to stay working for myself. So that, um, that pressure sort of, it was playing on me. Like, Sahail was beside me and we're doing the social media stuff, but it just got to a head where I really had to do something. So while he's um, plugging away with the social media stuff and organising content schedules and stuff like that, websites. Um, I started dabbling with doing a few designs. And um, I think I had about 21, it's quite specific, um, failed campaigns um, before we hit our first winner. And it, it was random stuff. Uh, there was no rhyme or reason why we were going into a niche. Um, but it was showing me what you can and can't do. So the whole time, and this is what I say to a lot of people, is when you're getting these failed campaigns, learn from them. Don't just shut them off and go, you know what? It didn't work, so I'll just move on to something else. There's a story in everything when you're, um, you're tracking that data. So anyway, um, I came up with this. Well, there's a political issue that came up in Australia, and it segregated a certain demographic quite unfairly. And um, I just came up with a saying that it just somehow resonated with them. So I, it was the basic, most ugliest design, <laughs> like Matt was saying, um, and I put it up. And I think, I can't remember what the budget was. It probably would have been 15 to $20 that day. And um, it tipped. I, the, it was, the goal was 25 And um, we just actually, well, we must have made just enough money to go away for a little bit of a holiday, a bit of a, get, a getaway. Anyway, um, it tipped that night. Um, first night there, we fist bumped and, and we were hooked. It was $250 that was ours, and I think we'd spent 25 bucks. Like it was just, you, it, it showed us the potential that was in there. So we so we've um, still got that niche, and we sell a hell of a lot of shirts <coughs> into it. Um, but doing that, like we just you know refine the imagery and all that sort of stuff and the designs and whatnot. Um, but as with a lot of people. Um, we made a hell of a lot of money through March, um, April last year. And that was when we first started seeing these age campaigns come through. And um, being that we were based in Australia, it was a very, very untapped market. 
very similar to how it is here in Europe. Um, so we did these designs and we put them up and the problem was trying not to sell a shirt. We had so many campaigns that were tipping. He gets a laugh like Dr. Hibbert out of The Simpsons. <laughs> and we, we had so many of these payments coming through. It was like, um, so this was Teespring uh, and they'd just do 10 grand bulk payment. So it was, we had, I think, two payments of 40 plus $40,000 come through, and it's like 10 grand, 10 grand, 10 grand in a PayPal account. I always believed there was this sort of money out there, but I had never ever had it in my bank account. I'm still blown away by the potential that is um, in these shirts. So once you get a good idea, like, and, the, and there's more than one way to skin a cat, right? So you've got um, Chris's method of um, digging really deep in interest, you've got other ways of um, getting a scalable saying and, and launching across a, a whole heap of niches. So um, you, need to, you need to find your way. You need to find a, a, a mentor. Like this is where these sort of get-togethers are really good. Um, you can pay for coaches and all that sort of stuff, but until you start meeting people, shaking their hands and getting to know people, um, that's when the true value comes through. Like you can help each other. And even though we're, we're sort of competing, um, Realistically, we're, we're all moving towards the same end sort of thing. We, we, we just want freedom. So um, we've got a, a few, well, we've got a few things that we're um, going to go through today. Um, we were asked by Fabrily to come here and explain to you how we sell shirts in Europe. So we pick a niche that we want to test that relates to a particular European subculture. We then create some designs that pique the subculture's passion and go about creating an engaging community through delivering value in the form of shirts and consistent interaction. So this sort of lends towards uh, Chris's way of thinking where um, we've got about three or four key niche pages where we, we build on that interaction, the engagement, um, providing constant value to people. So uh, we've got one beard page where every Friday we'll, <laughs> we'll put a quote up, guys, show us your beards, and we'll get hundreds of comments. It's up to about 30,000 fans on there now. Um, and just like constantly asking those questions. So Facebook's always changing their algorithms. Um, and what happens, everybody's always up in arms. They're like, oh, my reach is just bummed out. Like, what do I do? But the thing is, Facebook was built on engagement and they're going to reward people who continue with that. So if you've got a page where um, you're asking questions, you're running competitions, you're giving away... Um, you know, free shirts here and there, like we constantly do it. When we're, we're out and about and we see people, you know, get their details and flick them a shirt. So, and then you start seeing all of these people in your, your, your designs, which is really, really cool. Um, so the topics we're going to cover is a one size fits all or a niche specific fan page, uh, pros and cons of selling in Europe, niche selection and design, advertising, targeting tips for Europe, Sahar is going to run you through a case study of a very successful campaign that we had go through Europe, uh, tracking the data, retargeting, and some final points. So, uh, do you need an established Facebook page with lots of fans to start selling shirts? The answer is no. And the great way about building um, these fan pages from the get-go, uh, we always, if we haven't been into a niche, we'll typically spend the five extra minutes of um, just building out that page put a cover photo on there, a profile photo, and launch ads to it. Um, the beauty of this is, well, we've probably got 50, 60. Uh, we've got a hell of a lot of pages in there. But what that effectively does is when you hit winners in these niches, you can, you can build on the momentum. You can um, create them into these um, key niche pages where you're building that engagement. What happens, and the idea of building this engagement and it's something that I've been trialling recently is when we launch a shirt, what I'll do is just put it up naked. So it'll just be the image. And what happens is you'll notice time and time again, as soon as you drop a link into your post updates, um, typically uh, your, your reach just dies. So I try to build on that initial social proof. Typically we'll, we'll sell a, a shirt here or there and that really gives us a good idea that it's going to be a, a, a good campaign. Um, but you get a hell of a lot more likes. You start getting comments early um, and shares. And then when we're ready to actually run ads to it, 
we'll edit that copy, drop the link in, and away you go sort of thing. So the reason we do it like that as well is um, you can't edit the ads as a PPE ad when um, you've actually started running ads to it. Um, so one size fits all fan page. So the pros, start with a zero and build organically off the back of campaigns. Saves you time, allowing you to launch as many ads in one location as possible. Saves you time by not having to manage a community. Um, like I said, like you can have several niche pages or with this, um, you can have a scalable message across many. And all that allows you to do, it, it saves you a hell of a lot of time when you start running these ads and it's all in one place. And what you'll find is when you start scaling up your designs that um, time is of the essence. So, you know, you want as much time effectively running ads, targeting, um, launching new designs, getting new ideas coming in, all that sort of stuff. So, uh, the cons, you've got no long-term assets, uh, limited opportunities to promote other products and sell directly off posts. Uh, and no authority or loyalty. Uh, a niche specific fan page, and this has you um, clued onto, is our particular or preferred way of running campaigns. So the pros, it's quite extensive and uh, you know, there's so many more. Uh, it's a long-term asset, so you can easily monetize the page through joint ventures and advertising. Once you start getting a few thousand fans on your page, um, you'll start getting approached by different companies. So whether you be in a motorcycle bid um, niche, like you'll get people like bid balm saying, hey, can you promote this for us? And they'll give you money to actually promote that out. So, um, and it's a great way to just build allegiances in the community and it sort of gives you a bigger, under like it takes you outside of t-shirts as well and start building a real um, well, not a real business, but a tangible business where you've got multiple revenue streams. Um, and that goes into advertising as well. Uh, Pre-sales, ability to sell shirts before advertising is started. I touched on that before where you'll often get um, pre like shirt selling uh, without spending money. It's a really nice feeling. It's akin to printing money. Uh, get ideas for shirts from the community by running competition and just asking the question. So, um, again, that engagement, the more engagement you get, um, you'll, you'll typically get a hell of a lot more reach on everything. So you'll start seeing the same people constantly coming in and commenting and, and hanging around, asking questions on your timeline. Um, and well, the competition that we recently ran gave us a great idea for a shirt. And I think it's on its fifth or sixth relaunch and um, it's still selling strongly. And it's one that we, we launched in the United States um, went into Australia, uh, and now it's in the UK uh, and Germany. So, uh, and we get everything translated. So, the, we we test it and make sure we've got a good message. So, the biggest um, trouble for Sahel and I is we don't speak German, Spanish, or you know we speak English. That's it. Um, so there is a big barrier to entry for us to try and enter the likes of Germany and, and Spain, like. We don't get the colloquialism, colloquialisms, uh, the phrasing and all that sort of stuff. But you can get people that can do that for you. Um, bulk order, so we had guys um, contact us and say, hey, we need 100 shirts for our club. Can you do a design for us? So um, that's another way of, of obviously just, it's a good payday. You do a quick design and there's some good money to be made. Uh, you get testimonials from everybody. There's nothing, that, what I, really, really love um, getting is pictures of people in your shirts um, because that is tangible to your fans. They can see that um, it is real, it's not a scam, um, and they're much more willing to, to communicate with you as well. Um, subscriptions and continuity programs. So this is something that we've been testing lately. Uh, it's a really cool idea. Um, we are charging people to get a discount on all our designs. So the niches that we're in, we, we're quite passionate about and typically they're sports based. Um, and because I do the designs, generally we've got probably five to 10 designs per niche going out each week. So um, these guys are loving that they, they get access to this. And what it does by them paying to get this discount, it provides value to them. We may not necessarily make a, a lot of money off them to start with, but it 
puts the initial social proof into the shirts as well. Um, and they're typically the more passionate um, people within the community too. So they're the sneezers that are going to go out and tell their friends about um, you know, our, our different businesses um, or niches. Uh, it takes a lot of time to manage the community and that's the big one. But the good thing about that is you can easily outsource it. Uh, it can easily be systemized. It's just um, the easiest way to build that engagement on your page. So probably three, at least three times a day, posting updates, asking questions. So if you're horse riding niche, it's like, uh, how many horses do you own? What type of horse do you have? Um, how much was it? What color is it? Like, people want to be heard. And that's what it comes down to. That's why they buy, sh buy shirts, after all. Everybody's got an opinion and they want to share it. Um, so, Sahail is going to talk to you about the pros and cons of selling in Europe. Cool. Hi, guys. Um, <coughs> Hands up for forward and backwards. Forward and back. Cool. Um, thanks for <coughs> all coming, st for starters. Uh, um, we're really humbled to be here. Like, uh, as Ronnie <laughs> sort of said, we started about a year ago. Uh, so, we're still very much students of the game. And, um, yeah, you know, there's some great people here. We're, we're really humbled to be here and, and to talk to you guys. Um, so, quickly, like a few. Uh, the presenters before us have gone into a little bit of detail about this, but we'll just go over it uh, quickly again. So some of the cons of selling in Europe to start with, cultural and language uh, differences. Um, so the language differences you can get around quite easily through the help of the Fabrily team. Um, so some of the cultural differences as well with sayings and, and things like that as well, um, they're quite handy with helping you with that because they have native speakers. Um, we've also... Uh, when we were campaigning last year and, and getting into niches and stuff like that, using resources such as, um, you know, VAs and stuff, like there's there's plenty of outsourcing uh, websites where, where you can go and find German speakers and, and engage their services. Um, one thing we did which was quite successful was um, approaching uni students uh, back home in Australia because we get a lot of foreign exchange students coming out uh, to, to study for six months, 12 months or something like that. Uh, we'd pay them, you know, for design ideas. So they would tell us you know, what might work. You know, we, we had someone, a German who we still keep in touch with. He's back in, in Germany now, but he was giving us ideas for Oktoberfest and things like that. So there's, even though there's like cons to uh, selling if you're not a native speaker of that language, um, there's definitely ways around it, yeah? Um, one thing you will find too uh, is different tastes. You know, the guys talked about that. Um, Gary mentioned it as well, the, the, different, um, the different design styles that Europeans like as opposed to, um, you know, Americans and Australians and things like that. Generally, Australia and America, um, you know, like the same sort of styles, but you will find it's a bit different um, in, in Germany, France, um, Italy, those sorts of countries. Um, so that's, that's obviously a bit of a problem. Sometimes, like, generally what we do, we'll, we'll launch the shirt uh, in English first if it sells and we bring it across here and, and we will just translate it straight across and hopefully, you know, the translation fits nicely in the design. Um, and then if it doesn't sell so well, then we'll change that design up. We also use different designs in English as well. So even though we might have one saying, we'll design it different ways or Ron will design it different ways um, just to try and get, you know, some people might not like the original design but like the saying. So we switch it up and sell that same saying multiple times. And, and that works, um, you know, it helps us in, in Europe as well because they like different design styles. So sometimes something that we started with, like the case study we'll look at, um, we, we did it in Australia and, and um, in the US and we sold a few shirts and that's why we tried it over here. Uh, but we sold a, a heap more shirts in Germany and we continue to sell more shirts in Germany on this specific thing uh, than, than we've ever sold. You know, and, and that just comes down to pretty much they like that design better. The saying's the same. You know, maybe, th maybe they um, relate to that a little bit more but I, th I think it just comes down to the design because we've redesigned that in... in um, English as well, and sold more back to your, back to the US than um, than what we're doing. Uh, so Facebook targeting, you probably saw in Chris's demonstration a little bit when you know when he came into the United Kingdom as opposed to targeting the US. Uh, the data that Facebook uh, gives you through audience insights and things like that uh, is a little bit more limited through um, the UK and then especially through Germany, France, Italy, those sorts of countries. So um, digging a bit deeper with external tools and things like that, there's still a lot of, uh, you know, precise interest there, but they just don't, um, you know, 
come readily available to you. Facebook doesn't go here, have this on a plate like they sort of do uh, with, with the United States. Um, pros, as uh, Craig touched on, the size of the market, massive market, yeah? It's, it's huge. And they're buying shirts, you see the, num the, the amount of money they're spending. Um, you know, and again, relatively untapped. The cultural and language differences, that's a pro as well because that's, you know, there's a lot of people that go, oh, I don't know the language, I'm not a native speaker, this isn't going to work. They don't go to the hassle of getting it translated, they don't go to the extra effort of doing the ads, um, you know, the Facebook targeting research and things like that. Uh, so when, when you come along, if you're willing to take those extra steps or if you're a native uh, speaker of, of German or French or whatever and you start doing shirts into that market, they haven't seen it before, um, you know, the cost of advertising is a lot cheaper and they're a little bit more receptive to people who see, face, you know, Facebook ads for T-shirts day in, day out. Scalability, so, um, you know, like, like uh, Chris was saying, it's easier to sell the same shirt over and over again and find new interests. And, and the idea, I guess, um, or that a lot of people try and do is find one saying and apply it to 10 different niches or 20 different niches, yeah, because it's, it's so much easier to come up with one saying, spray it far and wide and, you know, hit five, six winners out of 20. Um, and uh, in essence, like, campaigning in Europe does that for you, right, because you can take one saying in English and spray it in different, different uh, languages, right? Now, that doesn't work all the time, but like we've said, we, you know, some of the niches we experience, the saying translates perfectly across. There's no different differences in, um, in the way they, they would express it. Um, and it works quite well. So we take a design, obviously there's a little bit more, a, a little bit of extra work in getting it translated and applying, you know, the, the new text to the design, um, but it's minimal, you know, and we get, we get the opportunity to sell the same saying in English, in German, in French, in, in Italian, and, and, you know, um, so we, we scale our design out and make a lot more money off one idea um, than, you know, we otherwise would. Can I just touch on something there? When you see all those shirts selling on the places like T-Scover and stuff like that and there's thousands of shirts sold, just think of that through spending the extra time and getting it translated into all these other uh, languages. There is so much money left on the table every day, even by these guys. Like they've got you know, their teams in place where they're, they're launching a hell of a lot of shirts. But if you bring it across into Europe, and that's effectively what we want to do, there is so much opportunity here right now to be able to do that. Cool. Um, platform and support. <coughs> so, you know, Adil said earlier that, and, and it's, it's obvious, Teespring acquired um, Fabrily or partnership, um, that the Fabrily pa platform is the dominant platform in Europe. Um, I'm going to take their word because I haven't used <laughs> anything else. We haven't used anything else. So, um, but, you know, the platform is evolving. And if you've seen recently, it's evolving very quickly. They're always very receptive to feature requests, you know, um, that we put forward and and um, the support that these guys give you, like we constant constant conversation with these guys all the time. If you have a question, if you have a complaint, someone says something in German, you go stick it in Google Translate, and you realise that it's a you know some sort of issue. If it's got they're a very question quick, mark, it's always worked. They're very quick to get back to you and resolve that for you. Um, so they're really it's it's like Craig was saying, you know, it's it's a community um, where. You know, they help us, we help them, and, and everyone's happy sort of thing. So um, that's that's awesome. Um, and finally, pretty obvious, but Europeans are people. They wear shirts. They have passions. They, you know, they're passionate about their jobs. They're passionate about their kids. They're passionate about their sports and hobbies. Um, passionate about causes and things like that. So, um, you know, and, and a lot of passions and things like that are shared across cultures, yeah. It might be a, a slightly different passion, but the actual, you know, um, the sayings and things like that do work across cultures. So, um, yeah, like we said, we've, we've seen success anyway in, in some of our niches, and it doesn't happen all the time, but that's the game. You know, the T-shirt business is not guaranteed to make money. There's certain ways in countries where you can, you know, increase your odds, and that's through, you know, niche-specific pages and asking your fans for design ideas and things like that and building that community. Um, but, you know, that's... It's good when you have that, but a lot of it, if you if you want to turn this into a business, I guess, um, you need to take some chances and, and you need to fail, you mm. know. So, um, yeah, I think I think for those reasons, it's it's worth everyone's um, time to to explore Europe.
All right, so uh, niche selection and design. We found, two, uh, we found that there are two main ways to find a niche worth targeting. Uh, Chris touched on it earlier, um, how like, you're constantly testing and measuring. That's, that's what you're, you're doing. Uh, you take, you're meeting people at events like this, you're seeing what they're doing, different strategies they use, uh, and then taking from that what works for you. So uh, option one is to use go, uh, Google to find the most popular sports, hobbies, professions, etc., in the country of your choice, i.e. top hobbies of Germany, most popular amateur sports of the UK. Um, and then, particularly if you're passionate about an interest, it's going to make it a hell of a lot easier for you to start really digging down into that. Um, especially before you have those successes, um, it's important that you've got something that you're passionate about. So if you're growing a community anyway, um, it's a pretty good thing. Uh, use audience insights research to find there's a sufficient and targetable market. So um, <laughs> we had a look at extreme mining uh, a few months ago. There's not a hell of a lot of targetable um, <laughs> things in there like irons that you know, older people typically use them. Um, use Pinterest, Zazzle, Tscover, Webster.me for funny or relevant messages, slogan for a shirt design. One of my favourite ways is Pinterest. Um, being male, I'm a little bit scared to say it, but I enjoy being on Pinterest because there's a lot of good content on there. Um, and there's a lot of funny content. So you just... Um, mix up the message of how you're actually searching for content. So it might be um, uh, funny horse riding humour or skydiving humour or something like that and just keep tweaking it around because everybody hashtags differently and uh, it'll show up. But, um, you know, there's different methods that people use when they're, they're looking at these sites as well. Um, if you see something, put it up there because Sahail ha comes up with all these ideas all day, every day and I'll sit there and go, no, yes, yes, great idea, let's do it. But the thing is, like, whether I like it, it's completely different or, or irrelevant to whether or not, you know, a thousand other people like it because they might not resonate with me, but sure as hell that the one I say no to is the one that's going to sell the, the, those shirts. So um, if, if there's any kind of humour in it, just get a design done and, and get it up there. So um, the option two is taking winning campaigns, which is um, the way we really like to do it because it's proven, obviously. Uh, and get them translated into the language of choice once known targetable market has been established. You got the clicker? Once you've found a winning niche, don't just leave it there. Start layering. So, men, women, this girl loves her runs, as in running. Um, marital status. I love it when my husband lets me go running. Other interests run now, wine later. Occupations account by day, runner by night, etc., etc. So. Um, once you've found those niches, it's, it's endless as to what you can do within that, especially when you start getting, well, it doesn't even really matter. Like, the fans that are coming on there, um, obviously, are interested in it, and you're going to target them anyway. Um, so, T-Scover is a great way to find a design template that sells well. Uh, the layout, weighting of an image to, um, to fonts, etc., that clearly connects with the target market. We've found uh, that Europeans are more inclined to purchase a shirt uh, that's a little bit more refined than a big and bold statement print like you see in the USA, as Craig was saying. So um, don't rip people's designs. That's probably one of our biggest peeves of the industry. Like, be creative. That's what we're here for. Um, you know, th there's, there's room. Just tweak it up. Don't go and bomb somebody else's niche. Um, there's, there's plenty for all sort of things. So... Um, All right, so um, so we'll just do some quick advertising targeting tips for Europe. Like uh, Chris went through some pretty in-depth stuff about using um, audience insights. We've got some other tools and stuff which which help us initially and um, and down the track as well. So Google Google, Google Translate, Google uh, Shopping for keywords and brands. Um, so you can see here just a little screen screen grab uh, running. So you know when we're looking at a new niche or something like that. Obviously, like we said, we don't know German, so we'll go to Google Translate and just get the keyword term for running. You know, then, then we go and have a look at Google Shopping and you see running shoes, running shoes for women, running trainers, running machine. We can then go and put that into, um, into Google Translate as well and find those other keywords um, which, which we can then use in Audience Insights to find if there's a, if there's a targetable market there and, and 
you know, interest we can target through our um, advertising, yeah? Um, we, as Gary said, we wouldn't use Google Translate to translate a, a slogan because um, that's, it doesn't really work too well, but when you're just using one word or, or one or two words like running trainers, um, running shoes, it works quite well. So that's a, a quick way to get started without having to go the process of asking Fabrily for translations and things like that. Um, and, and using keywords and things like that is, you know, like we did that brainstorming session, you know, looking for keywords um, for golf, what you'd look for. So, um, you know, there's heaps of tools. <laughs> Google's a good one, obviously. Um, you know, similar web and things like that. Uh, Amazon Shopping, when you start typing in, you know, the start of a keyword, it, it gives you more suggestions on things to search for. So, um, and that can really help you when you're looking for things to target in, um, in your Facebook ads. Um, similar web. Um, so if you go and uh, if you find a, a you know we, we looked at magazines and things like that or, or online shopping sites. So if you find an online shopping site or an online magazine, you go punch that into similar web, right? And it comes up and gives you a, a whole heap of things. It comes and gives you the countries that all the um, the traffic's coming from. It gives you uh, referring and destination sites. So you see um, you know where the person was clicking before they came over to you know um, runnersworld.co.uk. Um, and then you see the destination sites that they go to. And, you know, a lot of times they're, they're browsing another running-related site before they come to this site. Now, the beauty of things like this is, um, you know, a lot of the uh, tools that you find in Facebook for interest, you know, uh, quick interest finding is, is all keyword-related, um, which is great if the keyword is related to the niche, like running, runners world, you know, runners.co.uk. But if it's not related they're not going to pick those up. Whereas when you're doing things like this, um, referring destination sites and things like that, you find running related sites that might not have running in the actual title, yeah? And you can use those as, um, as interest to target. And again, then th it's not always the case that you can actually target it, but when you find the ones that are, um, you know, they're, they're deeper interests that um, people who, you know, don't go digging for it aren't going to find. They're free tools um, too, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think you can pay for a pro version. We've never paid for it. Um, organic keywords. So again, w you know, we looked at the runners, running trainers, but there's a section in uh, similar web. You should have a look at it when you when you get time. Um, it shows you keywords that people search for to end up on that page. Um, visited sites and similar sites. So it, you know, those those are other things that give you different related um, pages that you can can then go and. Um, you know, dig deeper into, have a look in, on Facebook, have a look on their Facebook page if you can't target it um, and get some information uh, about that niche. Um, so audience insights, uh, again, Chris went into fairly uh, deep detail in it. Obviously, we're using that for targeting. Um, it's, it's a super tool. Um, use English and native language keywords. Combine them to see what interests come out use them separately as well to see what interests come out, yeah? So we would, we would put all our, um, you know, German keywords like running, running trainers, any ru German running magazines that we find, we'd put them in separately into Audience Insights to see what interests we get. Um, and then vice versa, we'd do that with the English keywords and then we'd combine them just to get all the data we can, yeah? Um, as you saw with, with some of those interests, they, they swamp all your other interests, right? Like when Chris put in um, golf or Rory McIlroy, um, it, it's sort of because of the size of those, it, it, can, it can weed out or hide, I guess, some of the more precise interests. Um, so that's why we, we really spend a lot of time um, adding and taking out and um, different combinations of, of uh, you know, targetable interests um, using audience insights. Facebook graph search. So a good, good one is pages liked by people who like um, an interest. Um, now this is a bit, I'm not sure what, what happens with it to be honest, but um, sometimes it returns really good results, sometimes it doesn't. So basically at the top of Facebook where you've got your search bar, um, you put in pages like uh, by people who like um, runners.co.uk, I'll use that example again, um, and then you go across to the pages uh, tab of the re results it returns and that gives you a whole heap of other Facebook interests um, which you can then use in your targeting. Um, you know, or try and use in your targeting. Uh, pages liked by page. So um, on Facebook, if you go to a fan page of something, um, again, I'll just go runners.co.uk, you come down the left on the side and you can see this thing, pages liked by this page. You can click that little arrow and it brings up all these other, um, all these other pages liked by that fan page, yeah? So if you're not into the niche and you don't know all the brands or all the other um, pages that 
um, you know, are related to this this niche like running, you come into here and you see this, you see all these other pages that that are liked by it, which give you more targets. Yeah, Pearl Pearl Azumi running, like I would never, or Pearl Azumi run, I would never find that, um, you know, by myself sort of thing. But this this gives you information because you're using, um, you know, authority pages, big pages that are in the niche and seeing what interests they like. Um, international interests, this may seem apparent or maybe not. We sort of overlooked it to start with it, um, and now I'm you know, wondering why, but just because you're targeting Germany doesn't mean you can't, um, in your ad and interests, target you know, US magazines and US shops and things like that. Um, we've had great success even in the US selling shirts, um, targeting ads at UK-based shopping sites, yeah? Because if someone in the US is interested in um, you know, horse riding or archery or something like that and there's a, a German shopping site that sells that stuff and they like that page, then you'd have to imagine they're pretty passionate about it, yeah? If they're ordering stuff from overseas, um, just, yeah, really, really good results from those sorts of things. Uh, so shopping sites and magazines, international, um, use those. And then Audience Intersect, we ha no one's really touched on this, but um, it's a valuable tool for targeting, um, especially through Europe where the data can be a little bit more limited. Um, you don't want to go... Uh, does anyone know what Audience Intersect is? It's, it's basically... It's, um, it's a tool where you can... So basically in Facebook, the default uh, targeting um, behaviour, I guess, when you start adding interest all into one ad is to say or, or, or... So you could have running or horse riding, yeah? But you can't actually do running and horse riding by itself. Um, since Fabrily teamed up with uh, Teespring and Teespring had an a, a agreement with um, a, a tool manufacturer um, or tool developer um, who's speaking later today, uh, he's, he's created a tool that lets you say target people who like horse riding and running. Yeah? Now because in Europe you, sometimes it's harder to find targetable specific precise interests, um, you can go slightly broader with your interests but use those, um, you know, likes runner's world, running this, running that and, you know, some running shop and, and that sort of brings down, um, it, it gets you a bit more precise because it starts finding people who like multiple interests in that niche and you can also use it to find people who like running and wine or running and yoga and things like that. So um, that's pretty handy. Um, I, I know we're covering a lot today. Hopefully, like, hopefully what you get out of this is you, you get familiar with these things and then, you know, if, you, if you're starting out, you know, at least you've heard of these things and you can start applying them to your campaigns. Um, and if you are selling already and you want to bring your things across, then you can start looking at these to get some more interest. And, I'm, like, all of these things actually work for English campaigns in, in um, America, Australia, UK, wherever as well. Like, that's how you get deeper into your targeting. A couple of miscellaneous tips. So someone asked before about mobile and desktop. Um, it, we, we always run both in Europe. For some reason, a desktop actually converts pretty well in Europe as opposed to the US where it chews a lot of your money um, and you don't get very good conversions. Um, we still always test desktop in, in the US, but not initially, generally. We'll, we'll always start a, a mobile ad and then add desktop later just to try it out. But right from the get-go in... in um, in Europe, we'll always run mobile and desktop because we do get sales and quite good sales off desktop. But not together, they have to be split because what happens in Facebook is, um, we've seen it time and again, is that they'll continually serve to mobile um, and you'll spend, you know, when, when you get a successful campaign, you'll have 80 bucks spent on a mobile and um, only a dollar ninety six or something spent on desktop. So be sure to yeah, split them. Cool. And the other last thing, um, if you are campaigning across different countries and things like that, um, ROI conversions is the key stat, yeah? Um, when, you, when you're used to campaigning in one country, you're always looking at things like your you click-through rates or your um, cost per engagement or cost per click and all, all that sort of stuff. Um, now, if you're in one country, it's sort of generally you have set statistics like Chris was talking about 12% click-through rates or 5% minimum, things like that. Now, that works okay in the US, but we've found very, quite varying results depending on the niches we hit um, in Germany and things like that. We've had, we've had some campaigns clicking through at 2% and we're still doubling our money. Like, our ROI is still double. Um, and, you know, I've never seen that happen in the US. So, um, always remember, like, 
you know, you might have to just re reset your baselines um, of what you expect out of your advertising. Sometimes it's much better as well. Like you get really high click-through rates. Sometimes you get lower click-through rates. Um, but I guess the key is don't judge it based on click-through rates or cost per engagement or those sorts of things. ROI is the, the key stat. Yeah, if you're getting sales and you're doubling your money, tripling your money, whatever, um, then you're doing pretty well, I think. Cool. So we've got to sort of get a move on. Um, just a quick case study. So, you know, just to highlight, I guess, the, um, the overall, you know, flow of a campaign, I suppose. And we didn't do this all right either. Like, you know, we, we missed some steps. Like I said, we're still learning new strategies all the time and, and things like that. But um, so this case study, um, a shirt we sold in, in um, the US and in Australia, and then we took it to the UK, and then we thought, well, we may as well go to Germany as well, because we sold a lot of shirts to Germany and, and something else before, and um, so we, we thought, yep, yeah, we'll give it a go. Okay, I think we sold a couple of hundred in the US on, on a launch, and then a few more in Australia. Um, got the design translated, sold six, four, 648 shirts in about seven days um, for an $8,000 payout, um, you know, about $3,000 advertising and, and so we ended up with about $5,000 net. Not too bad for a shirt that's already run and won somewhere else and for the sake of sending an email to get a translation and five minutes to put the new text on a design and probably, you know, half an hour or an hour of targeting initially, um, you know, to, to find out that we we're onto something here um, and then we could scale it um, through, through, through the whole uh, seven days. Um, so the first step in, in anything, I guess, again, is determine that a targetable market exists. Um, and targetable market's a key word, yeah. You need to be able to get in there and find sufficient audience with precise interests. And to do that, we use um, AI. Initially, we do it um, fairly broad interest just to see that there's enough audience there. Um, and as long as Facebook's giving us that data of other pages liked, um, liked by these people with affinities and things like that, um, then we, we basically would go to the extra step of getting our design translated and go from there. Um, so step two, campaign launch. Um, so it's not only a translation for the shirt that you want to get done. Be prepared. Get your sales page um, copy translated. Um, get your Facebook post copy translated to German as well. Um, get your retargeting copy translated. Um, we haven't really touched on retargeting yet, but you know, throughout the campaigns that you run, you should be retargeting and use different <coughs> sales copy on different ads. So, um, you, and, th and that gets quite standard after a while. So get all those things translated, and then you can use them over and over again down the track. Yeah, um, and pricing and product selection colors. Um, you know, pricing can make or break, and I think Craig touched on it before, but if you're not sure what price point to set in different countries in Europe, just ask the guys. If you're not sure what colours to, to create, um, you know, to use for your shirts, just ask the guys um, and get that set up properly. And then finally, just uh, make sure you have your tracking code set. Um, yeah, an absolute must. You know, back when we first started, we didn't know what retargeting was. We didn't really, you know, we, we weren't tracking, like, sales, you know, it was, it was crazy. It was just, I, I don't know what we were doing, but, um, <laughs> you know, we, we'd see the sales come through and we knew what we were spending and we were just comparing ad versus ad, you know, for statistics, which was, you know, but um, save yourself a lot of time and a lot of money and set, set this up because 30 seconds here can make you hundreds, if not thousands of dollars over a winning campaign, okay? Um, so conversion pixels are must because it, it lets you track which ads are converting, right, um, and lets you scale effectively, okay, so adding budget and things like that to the ads that are converting um, and lets you maintain an ROI um, and your retargeting pixel is really important as well um, so that you can build your audience and retarget to them and then also you have an audience for future campaigns which you can launch your shirts to, um, which, you know, you get very good return on investment on, on retargeting ads. Um, and then Google Analytics. So, so Fabrily's in incorporated Google Analytics and that's pretty important because um, they don't have variable tracking uh, on their site. Um, if anyone knows what variable tracking is, they don't have it. Uh, so the only way to tell which, which ads are actually converting is through Google Analytics and, um, and the flowchart through there. So make sure you set those up. Um, so step three was the in-depth interest research. So, at, you know, at that point after we had everything done, it was time to sit down and actually dig really deep with, you know, methods Chris talked about and using those tools that we, we touched on earlier um, to find uh, decent interest. Um, we set up an initial PPE ad on this at this stage as well, $15 budget. 
Um, I think we had about 12 to 13 interests across different categories. So we always try and work with um, a couple of you know, celebrities, again, not the top celebrities, but a couple of celebrities, a couple of magazines, a couple of shops, a couple of events, a couple of... So just so that you, um, you know, you're spreading across the group of interests that people in that um, niche might be interested in. Um, I think that was a Don Wil out of Don Wilson's ad, ad crack course where um, he sets up a tree of, of different things to target and then, and then groups it into a... Um, so after we launched that, we launched uh, all our shirts into Germany and anywhere. We try to launch um, the ads so they start um, first thing in the morning. Gives it a bit of time for Facebook to warm it up. You get some lunchtime sales, hopefully. Um, and then by the time the afternoon and evening comes along, when people are buying, it's, it's, you know, it's got a bit of momentum behind it. You've got a few clicks, clicks through, shares, that sort of thing. Um, so, so we launched this one at about midnight our time. Um, because it was a... Australia. You know, yeah. Um, so step five was a bit of a wait and see. I went to bed, woke up the next morning, had seven sales off $12 ad spend. Um, pretty good start to a campaign. So we knew we were on a bit of a winner. Um, initial scale was budget up to $50 daily. Now, you know, that's evolved a bit now. We wouldn't normally do that. But given such a strong start, we just wanted to capitalise on that. Um, as Chris said, if you start bumping your budgets too high too quickly these days, um, you start seeing a big decline in your ROI. Um, but this is what we did with, uh, with this. Um, so initial scale was to up that budget on our first PPE ad um, to $50. And then we started looking at more interest because, you know, we only started with a, with a set and there was a lot more there. So we started creating new PPE ads as well um, just to see if we could um, find more interest that would convert for us. Um, cool. So then that ran for another uh, 24 hours. Uh, it tipped. We'd sold 50, 50 odd shirts for about $120 at that point, I think. Um, and at this, at this point, we actually had some real data because we had enough sales, we had enough clicks. We could then go into our Facebook ad reports and start seeing, you know, male, females, um, age groups and things like that were, that were buying. At the first stage, you know, when you've got seven sales, you don't really have enough data at that point. Well, we don't feel like we've got enough sales data to say this demographics buying, you know, because you've got one sale for women 35 to 44. I mean, you know, to scale up on that specific demographic off one sale for us doesn't seem right. Um, so, you know, by the time it had tipped, um, obviously you don't usually sell, it's, it's not often when you're starting out you're going to sell 50 shirts in, you know, in a day and tip a campaign, but you need a few sales there before you can start splitting and scaling. You go and have a look at your Facebook ads report and you start... Um, having a look at, you know, responder demographics, male, female, age groups, uh, split and scale. Um, and at this point, we still didn't know which interests were buying because we had bulk PPE ads set up. So what we then did is that clustering approach where um, we started splitting out those PPE interests into ads where we would split out and say, all right, so here's magazine interests, here's the shopping interests, here's the... Um, you know, the forum's interest and, and things like that so that we could then start tracking um, which, uh, you know, certain... Or, or it was a little bit more finer detail so we could see which interests were actually converting. The reason why we didn't go down to single interest was because we didn't have the actual audience there. Um, in those co For the interests we chose, if we went single, single interest and specific age groups, we'd end up with audiences, you know, under 10,000, which we don't really like doing. We like to keep our audience size up a bit because it lets you scale into it a bit better, or we feel it does. Um, and also, um, we've just got this feeling like Facebook has a momentum or something going in, in, um, in its algorithm where, um, you know, the bigger the audience, the more momentum it can gain when it's converting and, and you know, you can scale up into that a lot better. So that's the way we went there. Um, obviously, there were some good interests that were quite large and then we would split those out separately. But if we had less than 10,000 in a single interest, we wouldn't do that. Um, so then we just kept scaling, retargeting and um, started retargeting lookalikes. I think this was about the fourth day. So um, you're continually scaling, um, you know, the converting ads, turning off the ones that aren't converting. Okay, so you've got to be making sure that you're checking reports um, regularly once a day. We always leave it, you know, 24 hours um, before doing anything. You don't want to be sitting there watching it every three hours and going, oh, shit, I spent $10 and didn't get a sale. Um, you know, that happens and sometimes you can turn off ads if you act too quickly um, and, you, you know, you can cost yourself some money. So, um, so, yeah, we just kept scaling. 
retargeting. So this is where we started using our audience that we'd built already um, to retarget people, uh, say, you know, who had clicked through to the sales page but hadn't bought the shirt. We, we'd say to them, you know, did you forget to order? You know, this is selling fast, get yours now. Um, we'd start looking at our analytics to see which shirts were selling, which colours were selling um, and start advertising different colours and things to them because they might be more receptive to that. Um, and at this point we also had, um, you know, sufficient sales and sufficient audience to build a lookalike audience which is a, another Facebook tool. Um, so that's what we did and, um, you know, that really helped our sales as well. Lookalike audiences are, I think they're more um, behavioural based rather than interest based. So Facebook will generate an audience of people like um, an audience, you know, that you've already got, a custom audience that you've already created or off a, p a conversion pixel. Um, but you'll see when you actually get to do it, it, it generates audiences of a million people, two million people, depending on which country you're going at. Um, so to bring that down, obviously you start crossing that if you like or intersecting that with um, semi-broad interests um, related to your niche. Uh, and then at that point, we were basically, you know, four or five days into the campaign, it was just a matter of continuous monitoring. We'd sort of exhausted, um, well, we thought we'd exhausted all the all the interests that we could target. Um, you know, we, we didn't really go and find new interests and start scaling anymore. We were just a, a matter of um, monitoring the ads that we had. We had a, a hell of a lot of ads because they were all, you know, um, segregated by age and gender and things like that, 10-year groups. Um, so we were turning off the ones that weren't, weren't converting, um, scaling up slightly the ones that were converting um, and, yeah, creating new uh, retargeting ads as well as the campaign progressed, you know, with 48 hours to go, 24 hours to go and that sort of thing. Um, so campaign wash up again, we sold, you know, 650 shirts, pretty good profit. Um, we relaunched it straight away as well um, and sold another bunch of shirts. Um, but I guess the key points out of it are, you know, it was successful because um, because we first identified that there was a market there for it, okay? We had a good design which we took across. Um, we then also, you know, you did the foundations right, like getting, um, getting all your sales page copy and that sorted out, setting up your conversion pixels and retargeting and all those sorts of things um, nice and early. We did have this flowchart to go through, but we're sort of running out of time. Um, so this is just a, yeah, Jessica's going to hand this out to everyone. So hopefully it'll provide a bit of value for um, the newer people who are here. The, you know, it's, it's one approach as well. It's not the be all and end all. There's so many different ways to do things in this game. Um, and not everyone's going to agree with the way we ran this. Um, but hopefully it will give you a bit of a... Um, you know, an overview of all the components that can go into um, a campaign and, um, you know, from brainstorming ideas, niche tar um, niches to target, etc., all the way out to, you know, scaling, um, retargeting sequences and things like that. Cool. All right. A lot of information, hey. Um, the thing is, just to get started, like, I want to touch on the success we had back in March last year. Um, it was with age campaigns and we were up over 300,000 uh, in a matter of six weeks. Um, but it's against Facebook's terms of service now. So um, while that magnitude was there, it still exists but there's just a little bit more work. And I can guarantee that there's an, another way, another... Um, something coming that's just going to open the floodgates again for us. Um, so <coughs> once we had um, launched those campaigns into Australia and New Zealand, we, we went through there twice before we actually started to move on. Had a, had a bit of success in the United States. Um, <laughs> we, we shut a campaign down that was up to 1,300 sales um, because we thought we'd just infringed it on trademark and then two days later we were like, did we? And I had a look at the USPTO and apparently it was a dead trademark, so we sort of um, can it a bit early. But that's what, what um, made us go into Germany. So we're like, um, where are other markets? Where, where are the big populations that could be receptive to this? So that's um, around the time that we really started looking into Fabrily and um, getting the, the, the uh, slogans translated. So 
and it worked well because we sold uh, over probably between six to ten thousand shirts there um, in a two to three week period. As Craig showed you before, is quite uh, profitable. Um, so tracking data, always know your numbers. Um, create an ad with variables, um, i.e. VAR equals mobile. Now the the more experienced marketers in the room are going to know what I'm talking about right now. But when you're starting out, this is key, especially with your PPE ads, um, when you're creating those bulk um, ads initially. So what it's going to do is that variable will show up um, through the analytics uh, and tell you what's converting. So um, it's, it's very important. I've got it on the, so yeah, so this is a website conversions ad. Um, you'll have your URL, fabrily.com, fabrily freaking rocks, bro. Um, VAR equals desktop one. Um, and that's how it shows up in your analytics. Um, you can't really see it here, but this is your PPE ad, um, and you dump your VAR, your variable over here. Um, you create a unique one for each ad that you run, because um, that allows you to pinpoint exactly where the conversions are coming from. Um, this I, I love, and I don't know how many people are doing it, um, but this is real-time overview of how many people are on your campaigns on Teespring or Fabrily. That excites me because I get to see exactly where they are on my campaign. So if they're uh, landing on a store, so I've got a couple of people on there. Um, and I get to see what variable they've come in on. So um, it's just, it's a lot of data, that, but it's, it's, it's showing you what's, what's working. Uh, boobs, I don't know what shirt that, that was. Um, <laughs> buy checkout, that's my second favorite URL. Um, and then another couple of specific campaigns that I store here. Um, and the thank you, that, that's a really cool URL. Um, that means somebody's actually giving you some money. So um, when that flashes up, which is, it's, it's exciting. Sorry? Sorry? What are we looking at uh, so that's um, Google real-time analytics. So that code, that's how I quickly showed you before. So you go into your Fabrily dashboard. Um, you set Google Analytics up. It's, a, it's a quite a simple process. Uh, just go to Google Analytics, um, create new uh, website, I think it is. Um, Campaign, there's, there's, yeah. Um, there's uh, like blog posts and stuff on Fabrily, yeah. so just check that out. It's worth it's spending a, it's a half a, an hour yeah, to do oh, it. Like, it's not even that. It's five it right seconds. Start, like, so. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it, it's just amazing because it, it's almost freaky where you can see um, these people hanging out. This is reverse goal path. So this is where you actually, with Fabrily, track um, what... Uh, variables are coming in on, where the conversions are, so the goal completion's over here, um, and that's how you're going to scale your campaigns out. Um, again, I think you need to set up the e-commerce, I just did this a little while ago, but uh, the, the other thing, cool thing about that is once you put in your conversion values, it shows you how much money you're making Teespring and Fabrily, and your cut. <laughs> um, so, just a Great, yeah, use Google Analytics to track variables, campaign spreadsheet, tracking daily cost per conversions, click-through rates, uh, cost per engagements, uh, cost per share, cost per website click. Um, with Facebook, the conversions aren't always um, tracked. Um, so you need as much data as possible to make informed decisions on what campaigns you're going to scale. Uh, and so ensure you follow what products are selling in order to retarget as effectively as possible. Create retargeting for other shirts that are selling well Fabrily Analytics. Um, so I want to tell you about retargeting because before we... Yeah. So um, retargeting, we, we have a, a bit of a process here. So um, you create your audience. Um, and the key statistics that I, I was excited about when I was looking into it is a lot of money is made by bringing back visitors. So people who have visited your campaigns, it boosts ad responses by 400%. So it's incredibly important to capture these people. Website visitors who are retargeted with display ads are 70% more likely to convert to your website. So once you've created these audiences, every new campaign that you launch, you're, you're um, boosting um, ads to these audiences to start with. Uh, create a series of retargeting ads, day zero, forget the order. That's when somebody's just gone in, they might have um, abandoned cart. Uh, day one, uh, other styles based on sales, other styles again on day two, uh, group of selling items, that might be a picture of all of them. 
Uh, getting ready to close the campaign, so you just say something like getting ready to ship out orders, get your orders in now before they're gone, uh, and final call for orders uh, 24 hours ago. Again, it's, like, it's just a matter of always having these ads running, so you, you'll bring them back to these visitors um, to give you the money. Cool. Um, so we need to wrap this up. As we're just running a bit over time, so I'll just skip past uh, most of this stuff. Um, so just to recap on what we've gone over, I guess the most important things for us are, you know, why not take um, your campaigns that you've run in English or campaigns you've seen run in English and apply them to the European market. It works, yeah. It might not, but there's there's definite niches and things like that where it does work. So it's a pretty easy way to get started in this business. Um, Definitely make sure that you're setting up your conversion tracking and retargeting and things like that. Um, they're very important to, to scale up and scale big and, and make a lot of money for you um, in this business. And then obviously the targeting tricks and stuff like that, the extra uh, tools and things we use in Europe which help us get um, those that additional information that Facebook's a bit, that's a bit harder to get um, in Europe that you might get in other countries, yeah? Um, so just quickly, this sort of stuff here, persistence is key in this business. Um, you know, you'll hear from a lot of people that people failed 21 times, 50 times, X number of times. Um, but if you keep persisting, you'll get there in the end. Um, goal setting consistency. So set your goals as in any business or any pursuit you have in life. You know, if you want to make $10,000 a week, break that down into... Uh, smaller, you know, smaller goals like daily goals and things like that, and that will keep you consistent. You know, you'll start working out how many campaigns a day you need to launch in order to sell that. Yeah, um, keep in innovating, testing, and measuring. So this comes back to Facebook advertising. It changes all the time, and it's different from niche to niche. So you might be running PPE ads at one point. Next minute, clicks to website ads uh, start working. Next minute, website conversion ads start working. That sort of thing. So um, be aware of that. Become an active member in the community. One of the best things about what the business we're in at the moment is the help you get from other people. You might be in business by yourself, but you're not, um, you know, all alone in there. There's a lot of people out there that are willing to help you. Um, so jump onto uh, Teespring News and Fabrily Insider um, to get involved in that. Uh, quickly, always be learning. You know, we, we always buy, we're always buying new courses and, and, you know, learning new things. So whether it's education, coaching, mentoring, um, those sorts of things or we've just chatting to, with people here. We've got to um, rule that under $100 we don't even talk to each other, we just get the tool because if we get one thing out of it, that's it's worth it. Yeah, and then finally, just do it. Take some action, get started, um, you know, the potential's there, you've seen it. Everyone's talked about it today and I'm sure you'll hear about it a lot more this afternoon. Um, but this business we're in, it's here for the long term. Um, you can set yourself up in this and, you know, become as free as you want, uh, basically. So, get started and... Yeah. Take Have action. Fun.